Well, good morning. We've got a few minutes um, before 10 o'clock, before we get started. So uh, I hope you're finding us and finding us uh, well. I hope you are well. I hope you're uh, at home. And uh, and most of all, I hope you're tuning in. I know that if, uh, if you're hearing that, I'm not talking to you. So that becomes kind of a deal, right? Uh, so anyways, Facebook Live, it feels weird to, I mean, it's kind of like being on TV, right? I, I haven't done that before. So, uh, so anyways, welcome. We got a few minutes before we'll get started. Um, I know this feels probably weird for everybody, um, but it is the way it is right now. So, um, so hang tight. I uh, uh, be be patient with us as we figure this out. I know we'll do that this week. Uh, this week we don't have uh, a full worship team and. And band and all, but uh, but we hope we can get that all put together for next week as well as we as we uh, work this uh, this situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, what an interesting day that we have uh, living into this uh, this this culture and this um, this worldwide uh, deal. So, anyways, uh, I, I hope you find yourself at at home and not stuck. I know I. I have some friends uh, stuck overseas and different things where they're trying to figure out how to get home and um, and all that. But but I guess that's just the way things are at this point. Um, so may God's grace and God's peace be uh, be with all of those who are struggling to figure this all out. And I pray that um, that you maintain healthy, uh, that you maintain. Um, Maintain your, your wits about you, I guess, maybe, even. Um, and so uh, here in just a minute, we'll get started. I'll, I'll start. We've got, um, uh, we've got some announcements. We've got some things coming down, but clearly those are subject to change. Um, uh, in fact, probably mostly uh, to change. So uh, it is 10 o'clock, and so I'll, I'll at least start. Um, if, if, you've, if you've missed the, this, this opening in the... Uh, and the announcements, uh, you probably got an email uh, with, the, with the worship folder and announcements in it. So take a look at that. Um, there are some things coming down, although you'll see main event on there, which is the, the, the big district teen event. That has been canceled. Um, so if you think you're missing it or whatever, you are not. It is not to be missed. Um, uh, or it is to be missed by everybody. Um, uh, there's a few other things. Our, our weekly events will be will be will be canceled, uh, but mostly this week because it's spring break. We'll keep you posted for the next week and things like that. Whether whether home groups continue or or whether youth group continues or whatever. But at least this week for sure that's canceled, mostly because of spring break. But also we just want to be safe and not not carry around and participate in spring. Yes, we are a smaller group. Than the, than the 250 maximum, uh, 250 person maximum. Uh, but nonetheless, it seems the right thing to do to, um, to just call it. Um, so so while, you're, while you're there and while you're maybe looking at the worship folder um, from your email, th there is still the devotional there that we have in there all the time. If you remember right though, last week I did, I did change some things. So we have been using uh, the same same basic format, only it was different. Usually we would read the devotional into Sunday, and so so we would end the particular theme, the week's theme, with Sunday. But this week, uh, this the, the next uh, few months, we'll start with Sunday, and then you'll read the theme out of Sunday through the week, start a new theme on the next Sunday. So you'll see that there. So, so the way that'll work is you'll see Sunday uh, is today, and Sunday the devotional begins with John 4, 5 through 42, that is the story that we'll live in well. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that are going on. Uh, please pay attention to that. Um, and I know that since you're not here uh, to drop your, your tie check or whatever, um, that, that's still going to be um, a need for us as we continue on in the year. Um, we, we do have PayPal. You'll find it on our, on our website, connectionnez.org. Um, um, but also Venmo, and I believe if you have a Venmo account, you, you can find it within the, the Venmo app. So there's, there's that too. So um, 
I think that's about all kind of the maybe housekeeping and announcements to, to take care of. We are at 10.02, so I suppose we'll begin. I'll, I'll, I'll open up with, with our, our invocation, a few words, um, a few words to that and to what's going on around here and, and what's going on around. So, um, so let's, let's jump in. We will be in John 4, um, John chapter 4, starting verse 5. Uh, running through uh, verse 42. And also you can put your thumb in uh, Psalm 95. We'll read the first half and then the second half if, if, if I get to that. Um, so, but to begin with, um, I, I just, I just want to open up with, with some follow-up follow from last week and then maybe even some suggestions for what we find ourselves in. So, so if you remember last week we talked about uh, there was a story of Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus lived into a system um, uh, that he was quite comfortable with and that provided well for him. And 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 Jesus came along and, and began to speak into that system. And and you could say that Jesus was disrupting the system, uh, if you would. Uh, he wasn't necessarily contradicting it. He was just he was just opening it up more fully. To how the Pharisees lived and operated. Um, so you could say, though, that, that still yet, Jesus disrupted a particular system uh, that was going on. Nicodemus was captivated by that disruption. And you can remember just a few chapters earlier, Jesus disrupted the, the money changers in the temple. Um, so, so Jesus has this, this tendency to disrupt us, to disrupt our way of being, and to disrupt the systems that we find ourselves. This week is the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Um, she and the disciples in this story, I, I think, get disrupted, if you will. They, they live into a system of broken relationship between the two, between the Jews and the Samaritans. And, and Jesus steps in, and, and in Jesus' story, he, he disrupts their, their system, their way of thinking, their way of being and interacting with each other. Jesus is disrupting them. If we think about that in light of Lent, even, we would say that Lent is this moment in time in the church calendar where we, um, where we disrupt our systems, where we disrupt maybe our habits or whatever, in order to lean more fully or more wholly into uh, God's story and God's activity that's at work in us. And, and so it is, uh, I would suggest to us, in these, in these moments, in these moments with the, the coronavirus running uh, through our, our, our cities and our country and, and the world, really, um, that maybe we could take that disruption and, and use it. Um, maybe there's those moments in life that, that you didn't necessarily set something aside for Lent to, to disrupt your routine for the sake of spiritual development or, or your, or your uh, spiritual momentum or whatever. Um, and if you haven't or if you have, it, it, either way, that, that maybe you could use um, this time and the disruption that you feel right now, the disruption of your routines now in in, in this time and culture where, where you're disrupted, your, your kids are staying home from school, right? Uh, that's a disruption. Your, your, your job may be um, keeping you at home or, or whatever the case may be. You may have been exposed and so you need to stay home and self-quarantine or whatever. But there's, there's, a, there's a host of ways in which this virus has disrupted our uh, way of living and, and operating in our regular routines. And so I, I pray that, that you could use that disruption um, for, for the sake of, of God's purposes and work in your life. So, so may you spend moments in these days um, in prayer um, and, in, and in maybe a, a, a deeper, more more contemplative, maybe, if you will, uh, way of thinking about how this is affecting you as you, 
And, and as we read the invocation, I'm going to go on and read a, uh, another prayer. And that prayer, I think, will, will open things up for us. That is, as we perceive this natural disruption of our lives, we might remember a few things. So, so hear this invocation this morning, um, and then the prayer afterwards. Spend some, spend some time with it. Think, think, think deeply about it, because it opens us up to, a, to really a, a, a community of people that, that we really do um, touch each other on all kinds of levels. So, so in, in, a, in, a, in a world of, of rugged individualism, we, we realize pretty quickly in moments like these that we are, we are, we are all um, kind of all in this together, and there's really no, no change in that. So, so hear this invocation, and then this prayer afterwards. Here's the invocation for today. Like the mountains that surround Jerusalem, surround us, O Lord, in moments of weakness and vulnerability. Be with us always, that we may never be shaken. Protect and comfort us with the assurance of your presence in times of deepest need. Hold on to that statement for a minute. Protect and comfort us with assurance of your presence in times of deepest needs. This is, this is the promise that, that God has given us, that he would be present. In the, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of tensions, in the midst of all these things, that God will be with us. He won't abandon us. Um, and he doesn't promise for us not to be sick or to be affected by, but, but he does promise to be with us in the midst of it. I, I pray that you don't get sick. I pray that all maintain health. And I pray, too, that the virus passes quickly, that we get through this uh, quickly and, and without uh, uh, too much harm. But, but hear this prayer. I think this prayer speaks a little more, um, a little more broadly to the, to the way in which the, the community and, and life happens around us. Hear this prayer. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health and making their rent. May we, who have the flexibility to care for our children when their school closes, remember those who have no other options. May we, who have to cancel trips, remember those who have no safe place to go. May we, who are losing our margin money in the tumult of economic markets, remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time, when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. What I'd like to do now is you sit with that prayer. Um, let's, let's spend some moments in prayer. This isn't intermission. Don't, don't get up from your couch or whatever. Um, but unless you're, unless you're getting up to reposture yourself for the sake of, of prayer. Um, yeah, hang, hang tight. This is, this is our, our prayer time. We, we spend these moments in prayer together every, every Sunday. So, so for now and for these moments, spend some time in prayer. I would encourage you to pray for your kids. Pray, pray for your, your spouse, for your husband, for your wife. Pray for your mom, your dad, or those who are vulnerable, both physically and economically. Spend some moments in prayer. The church, these are those times. Um, I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to seclude these times to only times of, of, of disaster or, or, or craziness that we, uh, that we pray. But, but certainly we ought to pray. So spend some moments. I'm going to leave it with you for a minute. Spend some moments and then, and then I'll pray as well. I'm going to step off just for a minute. Um, and, and I want you to, to pray on your own and, and think of... Um, 
Think of all that need prayer this morning in the wake of, of this uh, coronavirus. So God, we do pray. We do pray for the vulnerable, for the, those who are economically vulnerable, those who are physically vulnerable. God, we pray. We pray your protection over them. We pray your presence over them. God, we pray your grace and your mercy to be close. God, for our community, that your grace would cut through the tensions. I know many are living on uh, shoestrings. Many are feeling the, the tension burn economically and even physically. So God, I pray that your grace would abound. And God, that your church would, would be a conduit of that grace. That we would be a people who speak calm, who speak your grace and your mercy. Uh, and God, that we lead well in what it is to care for our neighbors. So God, we pray for our neighbors. We pray for those who live around us that, that we might interact well with them. God, help us to care for those around us that need care, uh, both words of encouragement and, and maybe uh, a meal, or whatever the case may be. God, help us to be good neighbors in, in these times. God, we pray that this virus would pass quickly. Uh, we pray, God, that this will not linger long, that uh, the, the hurt and the pain um, would subside, would be less. And God, we, we pray that we would not find this time to, to hoard that which we have, but to share. God, for those of us who, uh, <laughs> who have plenty of toilet paper, we pray for those who do not. God, help us to be generous with what we have. And God, in that generosity, I pray that, that you would multiply that which is needed. We know that you often provide. So God, may we be part of that provision for those around us. God, we pray that people would rise up and reveal your grace and your mercy that is indeed at work in this world. God, and in these times, I pray your hope, that your hope would abound, and that we would all know just a bit deeper what it is to be the church. Amen. So what it is to be the church is, is always um, a question on my mind, even from the time I was in school, that was always the, always the question in classes, what does a good church look like? A good church looks like a, a body of people that, that, that certainly come together in worship and, and, and worship well with, with, with genuine hearts and spirits, with with, with authentic desire to know God and to be a part of his work and his activity in the world. Uh, but beyond that, so too a good church is a people who care for those around them. As, as we prayed this morning, as we've already talked about, that a good church is, is a people who, who cultivate this story of God's grace that is shown in the life, death, and, and resurrection of Jesus. That, that this is what we call ministry. Ministry is, these, is this, this moment in time that we tell the story, that we embody the story. And so I pray particularly in these moments, but in all moments, whether, whether in national crises or not, that we would be a people that, that work towards your, work towards God's wholeness and, and, and God's goodness 
that, that we do believe is at work in this world. And we are participants in that. That this story tells the story of, of a people saved by both sin and, and death. And that is, in this life, we are, we, we are, we are saved from the compulsion to, to, to sin, this compulsion to, 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 to in these moments, uh, to horror, which is, which is not of God. Generosity is from God. And so as we share this message, we, we, we call this ministry. This is, this is what we do as a church, as we, as we cultivate the telling of this story in all sorts of ways. There's all kinds of ways in which we can do that. We do that around here. So, so I know I, I mentioned uh, both, both PayPal and Venmo earlier, but that's part of being a church. That's part of continuing the way in which we tell the story. So th this is what it is to be a good church. It's to be a people. That, that whether we're in the same room worshiping together or, 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 or whether we're, we're online worshiping together, it, it's the spirit in which we carry with us that that makes us the church, ultimately. This, this building, this facility in which I stand is, is not the church in this sense. We might call it the church. It's the place we gather. It's the place we can, we can all be together physically. Um, but certainly that's not the depth of the church. The depth of the church is in the spirit in which we carry. And so I pray that you would find yourselves um, in, in rhythms and, and habits and, and even systems that sometimes Jesus will disrupt that cultivate that life in you, that spirit in you. So that's why we continue to gather. Since we have this opportunity on, on Facebook, unlike pre previous generations, we have this opportunity. So, so we still hopefully come together, uh, at least in a virtual space where we can um, hear a, a word, not just from me, but a word from the Lord. So I pray this morning that, that as, you, as you sit and listen, and as you hear, that you will find yourself um, um, touched by God's voice, that, that God would speak into your life um, as, you, as you ponder uh, these, these times of disruption. So, so that's, let's, the, the sermon, though, what, is, what does that have to do with the sermon? Well, we're we're going to get there. And, and here's the story from John chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 5, and I'm going to go ahead and read all the way through 42. And it's a, it's, a long, it's a long piece, but it is the entirety of the story that I think captures, uh, captures what we need to talk about this morning. So, so pay attention, hear the story. Um, the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. So Jesus, um, he, he, he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey. So he sat down at the well, and it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy some food. And the Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans don't associate with each other. So Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift, if you recognize God's gift, and who is saying to you, Give me some water to drink, you would be asking him, and he would give you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket. And the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well, and he drank from it himself. And he and, and did his sons and his livestock. livestock. And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give the water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty 
and I will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, get your husband and come back here. And the woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. And the woman said, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you and your people say that it's necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit, and it is necess necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. The one who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will teach us, teach everything to us. And Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. Just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and were shocked that he was talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? The woman put down her water jar and went into the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything I've done. Could this be the Christ? They left the city and were on their way to see Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples spoke to Jesus saying, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And the disciples asked each other, has, has someone come and brought him food? And Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. Don't you have a saying, four more months and then it's time for harvest? Look, I tell you, your eyes, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is a true saying, that one sows and another harvests. I have sent you to harvest what you didn't work hard for. Others worked hard, and you will share in their work. Many Samaritans in the city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she, when she testified. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his words. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. Hmm. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Um, what a story. Um, I'm sure many of you, and if not, we'll talk about it, but many of you have heard and understand the, the tensions between the Samaritans and the Jews. And I want to open that up a little bit to, to set the stage for the, for the story and, and, and really the disruption that Jesus is, is pressing into. The, the Samaritans, they, they, actually, they actually were of Jewish lineage. Uh, several hundred years earlier, Jerusalem was one uh, uh, com complete kingdom, if you will. Um, but then there was a division, Solomon's son, uh, the, the, the ten tribes to the north, the two tribes to the south. Um, the, the ten tribes in the north, though, uh, the Israel, they, they had been conquered by Assyria. Uh, Assyria comes in, kind of disperses the people, the Jews, um, and they begin to, to, to intermarry. Um, that may or may not have been by choice. Most likely it was not by choice. It was a conquering army. It was a conquering nation. And so they, they, they're, they're swallowed up, if you will, by, by the, the Assyrians. They're intermarried. But, but not only that, there's, for, for generations, the Assyrians also brought their, their pagan ritual and, and and pagan religions and, and all that with them. And, and though the, though the um, 
though the, the Jews at the time would, would maintain their worship of Yahweh, it's, it's sad that, that entirely possible they, they, they kind of had their just-in-case gods as well. So the Assyrian gods uh, are, are around and, and part of culture. They're, they're pressing in, and, and, and everybody just kind of gets swallowed up in this, in this mix of religious ritual. So the southern, the southern kingdom Jews, which is which is where Jesus is, is, is coming from, his disciples are. Um, that whole culture and world saw them as as not pure Jews, and maybe even saw them as sellouts. And though they would say they worship Yahweh, there's still this this lingering tension that says, "Well, you've got these other gods, and and, and you've you've not been faithful to Yahweh." Um, and all this language is part of what sets up the, the, the tension. So this Samaritan woman still, still holds to Jacob as ancestor. But the, but the tension remains that, that she is not, she's not pure Jew. Not, not in DNA or possibly not in worship. We're, we're not real sure for her personally or even that city of Sakaar. Uh, where they may have been in their religious worship. Uh, but nonetheless, the, 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 the tensions have been set over the generations. And there was this great divide between the, the Samaritans and the Jews. And so Jesus steps in. The, the scripture tells us he, he had to go through Samaria. But, but that's not, I don't, I don't, not real sure why they said that, it's, it's certainly not because of the shortcut. I, I don't suspect. Um, if he needed the shortcut, he, he, he probably wouldn't have stayed an extra two days with these people. So, so why is it? It said he, he, he needed to go through Samaria. There was a, there was a, 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 a travel route that, that went east and crossed the Jordan River and, and traveled up the east bank of the Jordan River and then back to Galilee. This was the, the normal route that the Jews would that the Jews would take in this in this uh, in this uh, travel. Um, it, it wasn't normal for them to travel through Samaria as they would. So Samaria is this plot of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea that divides um, what would have been the Southern Kingdom and and Galilee in the north, and it's this gap there. So they decided, Jesus decided, we're going to go through, but he said he had to. I would say that he, he had to for the sake of, for the sake of the story. So there's a, there's a couple stories that we might need to look at um, in the Old Testament that surround, that surround the, this, this idea of, of meeting a woman at the well. Let me find my place here. Um, So, so three different stories. The first one being in Genesis 24, Abraham sends a servant to find a wife for his son Isaac. And, and, and that servant finds Isaac's wife, Rebekah, at, at a well. And then the, the second story is, is Jacob on a journey to find a wife, finds Rachel at a, a well. And the third one is Moses, an encounter at the well leads him to find his wife, Zipporah. She didn't necessarily meet him at the well. But it was that encounter at the well that led him to this marriage. And I, and I think this is important for us to understand, this idea of, of, of marriage. So let's, I'm not trying to suggest that Jesus is finding a wife in the Samaritan woman. But what I am trying to suggest is that, is that Jesus, in the gospel stories, Jesus is, is, is called the, the bridegroom. And, and, and Jesus has come to... to, to to gather his, his, his bride, the, the church, his, his body. He, he came to do this. And so, so I think it's important for us to understand what's going on here in, in, in the history of the Jewish people and where they come from. That, that marriage is, marriage is this, this, this act of a, a coming together of, of two family entities. Uh, they might be of the same people group, which, which again, the, the Samaritan woman, she would still be a part of the same people group, at least her lineage. 
But the idea is that, that in marriage, there is, a, there is a covenant between two family groups. They, they come together and they, and they covenant with each other uh, for, for the sake of uh, life to flourish, if you will, the offspring and, and more family. So it's this gathering of family throughout the Old Testament as marriages come together. It's this, it's this expanding of, this growing family, this growing covenantal family. It's both covenanting with each other and with God um, for the sake of new life in the, the people. So I think it's significant for us to understand that as we read this story, that, that Jesus that speaks to this woman at the well. So, so not only is he crossing the, 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 the cultural system of, of really kind of hatred between the Samaritans and Jews, uh, but he's also crossing another boundary that is, that, that is a, a social faux pas, and that is just for a rabbi to be speaking to a woman, uh, particularly a, a woman of the city, as this Samaritan woman uh, probably was. So when Jesus opens up the conversation about marriage. He, he's, really, he, he's really opening up the conversation as, as to uh, particular loyalties. And I think it's safe for us, as we read and understand the story, it's safe for us to understand that, or to, to ask the question of ourselves that where our loyalties are. Where are we covenanted? To where does our covenants lie? Do, do we uh, covenant with the Lord and the Lord only? Or do we have several husbands, if, if, if you will? I'm working the metaphor, so hang, hang with this story. This is, this is where the, the story is, is at. And this is the, the, the momentum and the, and the development that Jesus is working with. Jesus is, is stepping into a cultural system. And he's disrupting. He's, he's stirring it a little bit. Uh, not for the sake of antagonism, but, but ultimately for the sake of a, of a, a relational covenant, for the, for the sake of reconciliation between a people. And, and so this is the, the story we've got to come to in this particular narrative in John 4. Are, are we a, a people of reconciliation? Are we a, a, a people that are, that are continually coming together for the sake of new life under the reign of, of Jesus, un, under, the, under the lordship of God, creator? This is, this is the story we find ourselves in. And, and so if we're, to, if we're to understand this element of the story in light of what we do for Lent, this this idea that we, that we disrupt our particular systems or routines for the sake of new life, uh, then I think it's proper for us, too, to hear this story that Jesus is disrupting this system, this broken system that is relational divide. He's, he's, he's disrupting this system to, to bring together a people group in, in, in covenant and in grace for one another, holding to the fact that, that they are all sons and daughters of God. There's another, uh, another story that, that we might hold to uh, in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 17, um, 1 through 7, if you read that passage, you'll, you'll read a story that the, the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, they find themselves in this in this uh, place where, where there's supposed to be water, there's not water, they're thirsty and they're upset. And, and there, there, there's, this, there's this great tension that bubbles up in this story that is God has been caring for these people out in the desert for, for years and years. The story says for 40 years God had cared for them in the desert and, and still yet they were thirsty. Now, almost to say that that the, the water in which God provided, or maybe the sustenance that God provided for them in the desert was not enough. And so there was complaining and there was murmuring. And there was, I wonder if maybe that element is, is something that, 
that we also need to pay attention to. That within our systems, as Nicodemus was in a, a system that provided well for him, we can still say often in our culture, oh, there's, there's, not, there's not enough. We still want more. We, we, might, we might learn from Solomon when he would count his money. It was always 666 talents. It's, a, it's an incomplete, now there's a number of incompletions. So there, there was never enough. No matter how rich he was, there was still never enough. So when Jesus begins to speak into this story about living water, he, he wants to say that this life of reconciliation, this, this life of a people coming together is a, is, is a life that is abundant, if you will. It, it's, it's a life that brings life. That, that when we live and act into a reconciliation with the other, we are living and acting properly within the life-giving flow of God's grace. So, so you can maybe say it either way, that, that, that the river is reconciliation, or that reconciliation is the river. This, this life given is wrapped up in a life of reconciliation. That, that we would be a people reconciled to each other, and it is the coming together in covenantal love that declares living water that overflows within us. That as God's grace fills us, it spills out into the life of those around us. And this becomes the living water. And if we are to thirst no more, we are to tap into the life of Jesus that is at work in this world, fulfilling God's good purposes of a people that love and live together well, that share with their neighbors, particularly in times of crisis. And so we're left with this question, this, this question of, of living water. Do, do we also want the living water? Will we say and speak the words of the Samaritan woman? Give me this living water. I wonder if, if, if we or, or you are, are thirsty for this living water. Are you thirsty for wholeness and relational reconciliation? There may be those in your life that you are in discord with or that you're in tension with. And I would suggest to, to find reconciliation within those relationships. You, you will find another element or piece of wholeness bubbling up within you. A, a satisfaction of all is right, at least in this relationship. In these weeks, as you, as you think about this idea of being disrupted by way of virus or, or work, you know, the, what, however the virus has affected your work or your kid's schedule or whatever, that, that you would find yourself thinking a little more deeply about what it is to live into or to accept the living water that, that Jesus is offering. That living water being being wholeness, being, being grace that, ex, that is extended to, to all of human life, for goodness sake, for, for righteousness sake. And I would suggest to us that as we find wholeness in this life, we find living water. And as we find living water, we find that that is wholeness that comes from from Jesus, the, the Savior of the world. So maybe take a few minutes this morning to, to think about those, those elements of life where, where you might seek wholeness. I understand that, that as you reach out to the other, they, they may not re receive it. That might be where you shake the dust from your feet, but 
But still yet, the effort is in your heart and your spirit that God's living water is overflowing from you into our relationships. That this story, there are so many elements that we could probably pull out of this story, but ultimately it is about a reconciling grace, excuse me, a reconciling grace that, that is a living water. And so I hope and pray this morning you've caught the, the imagery that you've caught the, the grace happening in the story as Jesus disrupts our particular systems. So maybe it should be for us that, that we're not afraid for Jesus to disrupt us. That we might even welcome his disruptive activities because it's always, Jesus' disruption is always for the sake of new life. The sake of of reconciliation. For this is the message that, that Jesus brings. The message of salvation is, a, is, is good news. The reconciliation ultimately of humanity to God through the person of Jesus. If we were to read in the book of Acts, we would realize that there is always enough. The first century church came together and they provided for each other. They cared for each other under this message of living water. And you might also, you might also find the story of the bread and the loaves being multiplied. This message that there is always enough. So, so may it be the church that shines in these moments. Whether we think we have enough or whether we know we have enough, that we will be a people that come together in provision and reconciliation to those around us. So if you would, I stand with me and hear this benediction. And now, may the God of peace himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him. And may your spirit and your soul and your body be kept intact and blameless at the Lord Jesus Christ coming. And the one who is calling you, he is calling you to be a reconciler in this world. He is calling you to live and act as he did, bringing groups together in reconciliation and love and grace. The one who is calling you, he is faithful and he will do this. Amen? Amen. Go in his peace.